holds enough credit. Our whole destiny was decided by a 12 year old. That's right, he made a decision he never changed by age 12. For the first time, the child Jesus looked upon the temple. He saw the white robed priests performing their solemn ministry. He beheld the bleeding victim upon the altar of sacrifice. With the worshippers he bowed in prayer while the cloud of incense ascended before God. He witnessed the impressive rites of the Paschal service. Day by day he saw their meaning more clearly. Every act seemed to be bound up with his own life. New impulses were awakening within him. Silent and absorbed, he seemed to be studying out a great problem. The mystery of his mission was opening to the Savior. So he was studying something. In other words, he did not know really what that's, that's right. Place before. Yeah, he did not know. You see, he had to learn the same way that we have to learn things. Step by step, there has to be effort, there has to be study, there has to be time put in. And Jesus did all those things, but he found himself at the right place at the right time to really understand. And where was he on this occasion? At the temple, okay? He was looking at the sanctuary services, and he was studying the sanctuary to find out what his mission was. So if Jesus had to study the sanctuary to find out what his mission was, what about us? I don't know about you, but when I first joined the church, I didn't get any studies on the sanctuary. And you know, new people don't know what to ask for. They don't know what's available. So they just kind of accept what comes along, as it comes along, and and just take it that uh, this is the way it works. Well, I never heard about the sanctuary. I don't know about you. Everybody has different experiences, but I never heard about it. Later, as I went through the system, I became a pastor. We didn't study the sanctuary at the seminary. And so I began my life as a pastor knowing nothing about the sanctuary. Well, the seminary. That's why I went to uh, uh, Washington at Andrews University over there in Michigan. Now, I don't know what they teach in college because I didn't take that course. I went directly to the seminary, but I know I didn't receive any information on the sanctuary in those days. And it was many, many years into the ministry before anybody made any kind of, a, of an issue out of it to me. And it was not from the work. It was a lay person who began talking to me about it. And I went, what in the world are they talking about? <laughs> and it kind of just slid by me, the whole thing. Well, you know, that's a tragedy because what I read on this page, if Jesus needed to study the sanctuary to see who he was, what his mission was, we have been missing out if we don't understand the sanctuary. Because God never changes. In Great Controversy 488, we read a little piece out of there yesterday. The part we read was Satan invents unnumbered schemes to occupy our minds. Mm -hmm. uh, they may not dwell upon the very work which we, with which we ought to be best acquainted. What do you suppose that work is that we should be best acquainted with? Sure. So he invents all kinds of things to keep us from studying that subject. Later this week we may get some surprises to see some of the things that we study and we think we have the gospel, but it's another diversion. Okay, it says here, the arch deceiver hates the great truths that bring to view an atoning sacrifice and an all-powerful mediator. Now, if you were to ask people in any church in this town, what is Jesus doing right now? 
What kind of answers do you think you get? Have you ever done that with people? Yeah. 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 Ask any any church person anywhere. Ask them, what is Jesus doing right now? And most of them will give you a big blank look. <laughs> they have no idea because nobody ever told them. They do not know what he's doing because as far as they're concerned, it all happened at the cross. It doesn't matter what he's doing now. It's all taken care of. See? But this statement we just read says that Satan hates the great truths. Two of them here, she mentions. The atoning sacrifice, that's what he did at the cross. And, what was the second thing? An all-powerful mediator. That second part is as important as what he did on the cross. And yet that's not being talked about today in the churches. And we haven't done a very good job either. And that's supposed to be our mission. To tell them what he's doing today. I'll continue reading on this page. Those who would share the benefits of the Savior's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness in the fear of God. They should allow nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness in the fear of God. That is the seventh day of Venice duty, to perfect holiness. And it says they should allow nothing Nothing to interfere with that. I wasn't told that one either. Continuing. The precious hours, instead of being given to pleasure, to display, or to gain seeking, should be devoted to an earnest, prayerful study of the word of truth. And I'm not going to ask anyone here, you can ask yourself, how much time do I spend in the Word of God each day? How important is that to me? These sentences are coming by very quickly. We live in a world that's really changed. <laughs> Even in the Seventh-day Adventist world, it seems like most Seventh-day Adventists think that... Uh, you know, five or ten minutes of Bible study is all it takes. We're not going to get it that way. It's not going to happen. Continuing. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. Clearly understood. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and the work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God desires them to fill. Now, she said two very important things there. She says, if, if they don't understand the investigative judgment and the sanctuary service, that's a combination there, it will be impossible What's that word mean? Impossible. Yeah. That one should sink in very deeply. When I first read that statement, I realized a lot of things I had done wrong as a pastor for 15 years. I was not equipping the saints to do their work. I was in this impossible class myself. Impossible to what were the two things? To exercise the faith. It's impossible to exercise the faith that we need today. Impossible if we don't know the sanctuary. And the second thing is to fill the position or occupy the position which God designs them to fill. That means missionaries. We cannot be missionaries as Seventh-day Adventists if we don't know what our message is. 
You see, we're not a missionary because we put a piece of paper on a doorstep. That doesn't fulfill the function. It's nice to share papers. But missionaries are people who have something to share about their life. So these two pages together here tell us something very important about the sanctuary and we haven't begun our study of it. There are hundreds and hundreds of statements like these. We are not Seventh-day Adventists until we understand the sanctuary and the investigative judgment. We can go to church on Saturday, but we're not Seventh-day Adventists yet. said that to an administrator one time and he took issue with me, but uh, I believe the statement stands. I'm going to read one more sentence on the next page. 489. It says, The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. So what he's doing today is as essential as what he did on the cross. This is one of the things we need to be sharing with people in our missionary endeavors. Next sentence says, By his death he began that work which after his resurrection he ascended to complete in heaven. So he began something at the cross. That's a whole different picture than the churches are teaching out there. They are teaching it all finished at the cross. It's all done. But we have some good news for them. It really is good news. Jesus began something there that he's completing and he is a perfect workman. We need to present the real good news to people. And it's not that everything happened at the cross. That is tremendous a tremendous issue there at the cross. But it's the beginning of something, not the end. Let's draw some of that. Now I've gotten used to that now. Okay, that's supposed to be a cube. <laughs> okay. A cube. It's a, you know, the first square we're going to deal with tonight. This is the center of the plan of salvation on earth. What was the center of the plan of salvation on earth? The altar. Okay, that's what that is, the altar burnt offerings. But what was it on the earth here? <coughs> the cross. Yeah, the cross of Christ. That's the center of the plan of salvation on earth. Okay, so let's just draw that. Now, let's draw the earth. There's the earth. That square represents earth. So everything in that square is the plan of salvation being worked out on earth. We're going to draw another square now. You're going to have to pretend these are squares. I can't see too well. Okay, there's another square. This is the plan of salvation on this side worked out in heaven. The center of the plan of salvation in heaven is another square. What would be the center of the plan of salvation in heaven? Okay, the most holy place of the sanctuary. Some you gave me several answers that were correct here. This is the most holy place in heaven. What's inside the most holy place? Okay. So we've got the Ark of God and the Ten Commandments inside, so we'll just make it like that. There are two more squares. There's nothing in the middle, so uh, it looks like a long room, but those are two more squares. Okay, do you see that? There are three cubes here. One, two, three. And I'm drawing it this way because that's the way the Bible describes all these things. 
becomes very important that we hold all these details as we study the sanctuary. All right, in the middle square, or cube, was the golden altar, the altar of incense. And please notice the way I drew that. I didn't draw it square like we see in our pictures. I drew it at an angle so that the points are at the points of the compass. North, up there, east on that side, west, south. Those points are very important. Table of showbread. The golden candlestick. I'll just make some dots there for that. Okay. So we have two large squares. That one represents what? Earth. Earth. This one over here? Heaven. Heaven, okay. So we have two reference points. What happens on Earth? What happens in Heaven? Now, just seeing this much of the picture, we already have this sentence that we just read. The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above, that's this square, is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross, that's the other square. So in one sentence here, she has described this picture for us. And when we understand the sanctuary, every sentence that Ellen White writes, we will be able to put in this picture somewhere. That's right. These books will come alive. Everything will have a proper focus, and we will not be confused. It really is important to plug these writings into this picture. Now notice I didn't draw it in a straight line in between. That's where all our pictures put it. But it has a southerly feature to it. Later on we'll talk about that. Okay, I think that's enough to begin with. We have all the elements that we'll look at in the next few days. Maybe I should move this over here. I won't be using those books too much anymore. The uh, walls were made out of white linen, okay. nine feet tall. What's well, about nine feet tall here? Maybe the top of the windows there. Anybody jumped over anything that high yet? <laughs> <laughs> kind of hard to do that. So what does white represent? Purity, Purity righteousness, uh, holiness. So that's what the white here means. This is all purity, righteousness, and none of us have the equipment to jump over that wall. We can't get in. So that's the first lesson as we look at the picture. None of us can get in here. This is the plan of salvation. As sinners, we have no equipment to go in there. But God has made an entrance, and we'll look at that in a moment. I gave you a measurement. I better defend that measurement. Nine feet. Because in all the commentaries, it doesn't say that. Including our own Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary. And anything that's in print in all of our literature doesn't give that measurement. Uh, in Ezekiel 43, verses 13 and 14, God tells us that the sanctuary had a different measurement than the normal Egyptian cubit. This cubit that's measured in here is called a royal cubit in Ezekiel. That royal cubit was a normal Egyptian cubit plus a hand's breadth. And it comes out about 22 inches. When you put that cubit together and you start measuring everything, the sanctuary, which had 10 cubits at the entrance here, and these are 10 cubit squares, comes out 18 feet, not 15 feet, as in the commentaries. 18 feet. These walls were half as high at 5 cubits. That makes this 9 feet. Now, you don't need to take my word for what Ezekiel is saying. You can read that sometime. But you might want to look at Patriarchs and Prophets, page 347. Alan White on that page says, 
that the entrance was no more than 18 feet. She uses the royal cubit. There are those who would argue with her statement, but I'm going to leave it right where it says she said 18 feet, and she said it was no longer than 54 feet. That's the same cubit. 347 is a fake chain. Now, by the way, Alan White, under inspiration, never misses. Everything that she has to say on any level, on spiritual things in the sanctuary, uh, any place you, you want to test her on spiritual levels, she's always right there with extreme accuracy, whether it's a Hebrew idiom, a Greek little phrase. She didn't study Hebrew or Greek. But no matter what you do to check her writings, it always comes out extreme precision. You can count on those writings. We, we should all of us in study investigate for ourselves, but yeah, if you study these things out carefully through the sanctuary, you'll see she never misses. It's an astonishing thing to look for. And so here she said 18 feet, and that's exactly what Ezekiel says, and there's no commentary I have ever run into that has the correct measurements, but on page 347, they're there. What was that, Ezekiel? 43, verses uh, 13 and 14. Okay, that's just a little aside here because we're learning interesting things not only about the sanctuary but about the modern gift among God's people, the spirit of prophecy in modern times. And it all holds together. All right, there was an entrance. And it was on the east side. God put that entrance there. What do you have to turn your back on to go inside? Sun. <laughs> Rising. The rising sun, yeah. yeah. Let's look at the Ezekiel, the 8th chapter. Ezekiel is full of good sanctuary information. Uh, actually, the whole Bible is. While you're looking for that, I just might mention that the first 800 words in the Bible are about the creation of our solar system. Yeah. The rest of the book of Genesis is about forming one family. Uh, very important family. In the next book, starting with chapter 24, God begins telling Moses how to build the sanctuary. In the next 15 chapters are involved in the details of how to build it. Now notice it took 800 words to talk about the solar system and its creation. It takes 15 chapters to build this. The next 27 chapters of the next book are all about what to do with this. The next book is all about the sanctuary. As you start working your way through the prophets, it's about God's dealing with the people and the sanctuary. God forsook the sanctuary four different times because of the choices of the people. You get over to the book of Daniel. The whole book of Daniel is about the judgment dealing with the sanctuary. You get over to the New Testament. The first book, Matthew, is about a king. Jesus as the king. What is the king of beasts? What do you think about? Lion, okay? King of beasts. Jesus was the king from the tribe of Judah, the lion. Mark is all about a suffering servant. In the Bible, a suffering servant is an ox. The book of Luke is about Jesus as the perfect man. The book of John is about Jesus as God, the eagle. Have you seen those before somewhere? Mm -hmm. Lion, mm -hmm. ox, mm -hmm. man, eagle. In Ezekiel, where we, we're going right now, he describes those four living creatures as around the throne of God. So there's no big secret about what it represents. It's the four phases of Jesus' ministry. Symbolized by those living creatures. 
So in Ezekiel 8, Ezekiel is being told by God himself to notice some things going on in Israel. God calls them abominations, wicked abominations. Come over here, son of I want to show you these abominations. And he starts showing him things. And they get worse and worse and worse. Until finally he hits the major one in that chapter. Verse 16. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the east. They worshipped the sun toward the east. Now this was God's true church. And this was his priesthood. And they turned their back on the sanctuary. And the only other place they could face was the sun. And they were sun worshippers. Now Ezekiel 8 was put in the Bible for a very, very particular reason. It's a warning to God's church in all ages. Do not turn your back on the sanctuary because there's only one other place you can face when you do that. It's called sun worship. And history has borne it out. Every time God's people have turned their back on the true plan of salvation, they start doing it like Sunday keepers. Now, there are obviously real children of God in all those Sunday keeping churches, sure. We know that. But the systems don't belong to God. The people do. Let's keep that straight in our minds. The systems do not belong to God. He only has one system at any time on planet Earth that he calls his own. Otherwise there would be confusion. And his true system deals with the sanctuary. That's right, just sheep. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so let's keep those things clear in our mind, but let's not forget Ezekiel 8. We have a warning here. Don't do it like Sunday keepers. We need to keep real close to Ezekiel 8 because Ezekiel 9 is the next chapter. You know what happens in Ezekiel 9? It's judgment time. That quick in the next chapter. Judgment time for the people who forsake the sanctuary. You don't have to read the whole rest of the book of Ezekiel to get there. It's the next chapter. When I first noticed that, it uh, sent some shivers up and down <laughs> my spine because I realized what a responsibility any teacher in this church has. Any teacher, no matter whether it's official or unofficial, it's an awesome thing to claim to teach the truth of God. We have to stay right in the Word. And in that chapter is the seal of God, Ezekiel 9. Yeah, that's Revelation 7 for the Old Testament. The seal of God. It has to do with the sanctuary. God's true people are going to do it this way. And that's what we're going to look at this week. What does this mean? What does it say to us? What is it that cannot be changed here? Otherwise, Ezekiel 9 comes. That's what we need to understand. No Sunday-keeping company, group, denomination knows this. None of them. God had to raise up a people starting in 1844 and through those years to know this by experience and then share it with the world. Our message today is not to convince people that the seventh day is the Sabbath. That's not our mission. It's one of the features, but it is not our mission. Our mission is to let people know that it's time to prepare to meet their God. Amen. That's it. That's our mission. And it's not like Billy Graham is saying it when Jesus comes in the clouds. That's not our message. That's not when a person needs to meet God. 
When they meet God is in the investigative judgment. Their personal day of judgment. Nothing counts after that. What difference does it make if Jesus comes, you know, 50 or 100 years or 10 days after that? The judgment is what's going to stand that day. And that's what we're supposed to be warning people about. We'll see it more clearly as we go through here. The sanctuary is all about how to prepare for our personal day of judgment. And it really is good news because we have time to prepare. None of us in this room have blown it. No one in this room has done that. You'll understand that statement as we go through this more, more clearly. But no one in this room has faced their individual judgment yet. And I can prove that from the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. We're still in the preparation stage. We're moving towards it. I know there's lots of winds of doctrine out there. There's a new person standing up almost every day saying, I have new life. Well, watch out. New life never destroys old light. It doesn't change it one little bit. Be careful with what's coming around nowadays. Everything has to be measured. Okay, let's get into it. This entrance on the east side was made out of linen material. It was held up by pillars of brass. And uh, the material was actually threads of different colors. It was blue, uh, scarlet, purple, and fine linen in the King James. That means white. So let's look at this entrance that God has made for a person to come through. They can't get in over this wall, this righteousness, so God provides an entrance, but we've got to see what he means by the entrance now. So let's break down the code for just a little bit here. Let's go to Exodus 24, verse 10. slowing down a little bit here because we have several days to work with this so we won't have to go back and repeat a lot of things. 24.10 it says, They saw the God of Israel and there was under his feet as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone. What color sapphire? Okay, we're dealing with blue. Here. And as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. What color is the sky? <laughs> so Here's a little trick. Hebrews always say things that are important. Two times coming at it from different ways <coughs> so that you can't confuse what's being said. So obviously here he wants us to understand he's dealing with the color blue because he says it twice from two different sides. Sapphire stone, the sky. There was another color of sapphire and that's why they did that. Yes, that's true. That's true. Sapphires are not only blue. So he makes the point here. We're talking about blue. Good. Now, in verse uh, 12, which just is a verse removed there, one day I was reading and I noticed how these two verses are linked together. And I had not seen them like that before. It says, The Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, be there, I will give thee tables of stone. Didn't we just read about stone? And a law and commandments which I have written. God wrote the commandments on stone. Have you ever wondered what kind of stone? Well, let's say in the verse just before that, sapphire stone, is it possible that he wrote it on blue sapphire stone? Well, let's go to Numbers, the 15th chapter, and let's see. And we'll go to verse 38. Numbers 15, 38. By the way, what we're going through right now, you can share with any person in any church because they don't know these things. And it's something that God wants them to know. So when we share this, we have a lot of help. Okay. And this will get the person to the true third angel's message. 
That's what we're doing. This is the third angel's message we're going through. Alright, verse 38. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. There's that blue again. Well, what are they supposed to do? They put the blue on the edges of their sleeves and down there at the bottom of their garments. Well, you know, you can't make your hand do something that's outside of that blue ribbon now. <laughs> and you can't make your feet go any place outside of that blue ribbon. So God has them harnessed in by this blue. So let's see what it says next verse. It shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember what? All the commandments. There it is. The color blue is the commandments. God was standing on a blue sapphire stone. The law is what he stands on. That's what he handed to Moses was blue sapphire stone. And it says here, remember all the commandments of the Lord and there's three little words that follow that. And do them. Now isn't that interesting? <laughs> God said, and do them. Well wait a minute. I've been hearing from lots of different places we can't. Isn't that an amazing thought? God says, remember, remember what? Please read your Bibles with me. Read, remember what? Oh, it says all, doesn't it? It says all. We missed that first time around, didn't we? <laughs> God said, and we're just at the beginning of the book. We've got lots more to do before we're done with this one. This is just the first mention. Remember all the commandments. Put that blue ribbon on your sleeves. To remember all the commandments and do them. Now why would God say something like that? And do them. Can we? Well, if we can't do it, we're dealing with some sort of a monster. Because only a monster would tell somebody to do something they can't do. I hope... Did you hear the comment up front here about Satan? Satan is the one that says humans cannot keep the Ten Commandments. Satan is the one that teaches that. God's unjust for us. We're going to move a little quicker, although we're talking slower this time around. We're in a church setting, and I believe the blessing of the Lord is here. He wants to open our minds to certain key issues. Let's see here, page 29 of Desire of Ages. 29. Well, I haven't used this particular book for so long. It looks strange to me. I'm getting used to the, the big books now, it seems. <laughs> That's interesting. Satan worked to discourage the people, to lower their conception of the character of God, and to bring the faith of Israel into contempt. He hoped to establish the claim put forth when he rebelled in heaven that the requirements of God are unjust and could not be obeyed. So who teaches that? You better remember that one. Satan teaches that, not God. Isn't it an amazing thing how many professed Christians would rather believe Satan than God himself? That's kind of a bizarre thought, isn't it? 
many Seventh-day Adventists would rather believe Satan than the Word of God. And there's a reason for that. We'll see what that reason is as we go along here because God has made provisions for every Christian to live like a Christian. And we're going to see what that is in the sanctuary. It's very clear as we go through this. We're just laying a little foundation right now. Now please, I have to warn you, if you weren't expecting God's requirements to be just exactly the way He says them, you could get discouraged very quickly. That's okay. Get discouraged. But know this. God has made provisions to get us where He wants us to be. So there's good news once we see how tight this really is. It is good news. Because God has never failed. He doesn't know how to fail. We've got to do it His way so that we don't fail. We need to find out what is His way. It always works. Okay, so we're just picking up a few little clues right now. On page 27, Desire of Ages, it says, God had chosen Israel. He had called them to preserve upon among them, excuse me, among men the knowledge of his law and of the symbols and prophecies that pointed to the Savior. God chose Israel to preserve among men the knowledge of the law. He raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church to do the same thing. To preserve on this earth the knowledge of God's law. Now, at the corner, there's a boulevard stop. And I noticed several of them as I came down through here. They're all over California, I've noticed that. Somebody has spent a lot of time legislating a law that says there's going to be boulevard stops at certain places. And somebody bought a lot of wood, and they painted a lot of signs, and they paid somebody to plunk those things in the ground in lots of places. Do you suppose that they mean for somebody to stop? If there's an enforcer around someplace, you'll find out real quick. Yeah. And you know, you might re remind your Sunday-keeping friends that if you stop today and he's sitting across the street watching you, he'll wave at you as you go by, no problem. But if you go through the next day, he's coming. And you know what he's not going to listen to when you say, well, I stopped yesterday. I fulfilled the law. There's no police officer around that's going to believe that one. And yet churches are full of people that believe that lie. Yeah. We need to be very straightforward and clear with people when we talk to them. And you know, people will take that. It's not an argument. It's just a, you know, that's the way life is. Simple, clear, straight line. God has never said anything that's hard to understand. He says, put blue ribbon around your sleeves, Israel. Put the blue ribbon around the hem of your garment. Now, try to make your hand do something outside of that law. Well, try to do it now. It's there to protect us. It's a wall of protection to Christians. Remember all the commandments and do them. We're going to talk more about that as we go along here this doing them. God could have said one more thing. Remember all the commandments and do them all the time. Because that's what he meant. No waffling, no vacations. All the time. And we're going to see why a human being without Christ can't and why a human in Christ always does. There's no third category. Do you know that there are people in the Adventist church today inventing a third group of people? Yes. There are people who claim to be theologians, who claim to be students, who claim to be teachers of Israel, who have invented a third class of human being on this earth. A neutral who will choose which way they're going to go. They call them innocent. 
Nobody is born on this planet without a problem. There's only two kinds of people on this planet. The children of the kingdom and the children of the wicked one. <coughs> there are no third parties that have not chosen which place they're going to go yet. Please remember that because there are highly sophisticated arguments shuffling around now all over the world through certain elements of sincere people who have invented a third category of human beings. Don't let that one go by you too quickly. Only two kinds of people on this earth. We can look at it a little more clearly when we look at human beings after the age of accountability, let's look at that for a second. There's still only two kinds of people. The obedient and the disobedient. There's no other kind of human beings. The loyal, the disloyal. There's no other kind. Just run that through your head and prepare yourself because there are some really terrific arguments coming by these people by some highly sophisticated means. But let's keep this the way God says it. Okay. If you want more information on that later, we'll, we'll get into it because it impinges on several important issues like who was Jesus when he was born? Uh huh. Who was he in his walk as a human being? These are issues we need to look at and understand clearly because there's a lot of confusion in our ranks right now. The sanctuary clears them all up. All right. Blue then means what? All right, we just read it. The commandments of God. And obviously, if God made the commandments, he meant them to be obeyed. So we're talking with the color blue, obedience to the law of God. That's the first color in that veil, the entrance into the sanctuary services. So we've broken the first color, blue. The second color, red. What do you think of when you think of red in terms of the sanctuary service? Blood, Blood okay. Blood. You know, I didn't need to read the Bible to find out that life is in the blood. Leviticus 17, 11. Because the first time I ever saw my blood out there, I knew it. <laughs> yes, I did. No one had to teach me. That red blood out there said to me, no, that's my life. <laughs> it doesn't belong out there. Well, we either have life or we don't. That's a whole 100% thing, isn't it? There's no half-alive people, really. We use the term, but you're either alive or you're not. So let's throw in a couple of quick words in here. We're just trying to break down these colors to see what God means by them as a means of coming in here. We use words like uh, surrender, and they just go by. I learned a long time ago to not take things for granted, to break words down until we all know what we're saying. So let's look at this word surrender for just a moment. Uh, in the Second World War, when uh, the Pacific Theater was finally uh, finished up over there, the vanquished enemy came on the battleship Missouri, and they came with their symbol of defeat. The sword was right there. They brought it. And suppose that day they had said to the generals and the admirals waiting, uh, we surrender 85%. No? <laughs> Wouldn't have worked, would it? I mean, after the pounding that everybody took in that war, somebody comes up and says, well, we'll surrender 85%. No way. How about 99.5%? No? That's pretty tough generals, huh? <laughs> what did they want? What did they get? Unconditional. Yeah. Unconditional. No reservations. 100%, well, however you want to say it. That's what the word surrender means. <coughs> now, we know that in this room. Armies know it all over the world. You suppose God knows that? That the word surrender means unconditional, nothing held back, no reservations. Yeah, he knows that. As a matter of fact, he will not bend on the point. He never has. So we've got two colors right now.
Blue, which means obedience to the law of God. And 100%. Nothing held back. There's a lot more we can say about these things, but let's move through here. Purple. It's the next color. And just coincidentally, when you put red and blue together, <laughs> that's what you get. It's purple. And purple in the Bible is the color of a royal priest. Royal priesthood. First Peter 2 9, doesn't he talk there about we're a peculiar nation? We're royal priests, king priests. Yeah. That's what a Christian is, is a king priest. And uh, white, we already talked about, that's purity or righteousness. So we've got all four colors broken down enough that we can see that when these colors are used in the Bible, they mean these things, but the four colors are put together in threads and woven to make the entrance. And so God has provided all of this in that curtain so that the person can come into the sanctuary. So what do you suppose that curtain means? What, what is it a symbol of when you put all those colors together? <coughs> Obedience to the law of God all the time. 100% life. Nothing held back. King, priest, righteousness. It's Jesus. The entrance is Jesus himself. The only way in to the plan of salvation is through Jesus. And you have to turn your back on sun worship to come in this entrance. We must never go to a Sunday keeper to find out how to grow a church. I can give you another big list, but you already can work with that. Of things we're not supposed to do as God's sanctuary people. God has commanded us not to do certain things. Not because he's arbitrary, but because he knows we will lose our spirituality if we do it as some worshipers. He knows that. He's trying to protect the real remnant. And by the way, don't think that everybody in the Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to heaven. Ellen White said she saw two companies forming. The big company and the little company. And guess who's who? That's right. She saw a little company forming. All right. So now we have enough of the environment to deal with here. We know there's a curtain. By the way, that curtain was held up by pillars that had silver hooks that pierced that veil to hold it there. It pierced the veil. What's the veil? Jesus. Yeah, he was pierced four times to hold him as the entrance in here. Yeah, the symbols here are just tremendous. They go on and on and on. We're not going to be able to touch them in four or five days here. But I want to hit enough so you know this is powerful. This is God's true gospel. And if what we believe doesn't fit in here, it's got to go. Because this is the truth. By the way, Prophets and Kings, page 410. I see some of you taking notes there. Prophets and Kings 4.10, it says a silver represents obedience through the Holy Spirit. That's what held Jesus on the cross. Obedience. He didn't want to do that for himself. It didn't feel good. He was there being faithful to his Father. Brass. Brass. The hooks are silver. The hooks are silver, yeah. But you look at that in Prophets and Kings. It's right at the top of the page, 410. Silver, symbol of obedience through the Holy Spirit. That will mean more to us, too, as we see ourselves in the sanctuary. All right, so a person now is ready to come through the entrance. Let's get a person. They're in the camp of Israel. They belong to the right church. <laughs> Okay, they've got that much going for them. They belong to the right church. They keep the right day. 
it's the right God. They were baptized. They seem to be in pretty good shape, don't they? They have just one little flaw. This person living out here in the camp was not told something, much as many of us were not told. This person is enjoying his religious life. He goes to Wednesday night meetings. He uh, tithes faithfully. He uh, gives Bible studies, church every week. Nice person. There's one little thing they're still doing. Sinning and confessing and sinning and confessing and sinning and confessing. And after a while that gets a little old and this person's wondering, is that all there is? Sinning, confessing, sinning, confessing, sinning, confessing. And the Holy Spirit is doing something inside that person. Let's read that. Desire of Ages 172. This chapter, by the way, is about Nicodemus and the born-again experience. Very important chapter. Reading the last paragraph, it says, The wind is heard among the branches of the trees, rustling the leaves and the flowers, yet it is invisible, and no man knows whence it comes or whither it goes, so with the work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. It can no more be explained than can the movements of the wind. A person may not be able to tell the exact time or place or to trace all the circumstances in the process of conversion, but this does not prove him to be unconverted. By an agency as unseen as the wind, Christ is constantly working upon the heart. Who's doing that? All right. Little by little, perhaps unconsciously to the receiver, impressions are made that tend to draw the soul to Christ. This person is not a Christian yet. But notice what means Jesus uses to draw them to himself. These, these impressions, these may be received through meditating upon him. Do you know any atheists that meditate upon Christ? Any infidels, free thinkers, agnostics, who is this person that's being drawn to become a Christian that meditates upon Christ? Next line. Through reading the scriptures. This person studies the scriptures. There's another one. The third one. Or through hearing the word from the living preacher. This person goes to church. This person studies the scriptures. This person meditates upon Christ, but they're not a Christian yet. Suddenly, as the Spirit comes with more direct appeal, the soul gladly surrenders itself to Jesus. By many, this is called sudden conversion, but it is the result of long wooing by the Spirit of God, a patient protracted process. Now, to me, in that last sentence we read just before, there's a key thought there. It says, suddenly, as the Spirit comes with more direct appeal, this person out here, remembers belongs to the right church. They've been sinning and confessing, sinning and confessing, but they've been learning, they've been meditating, they've been studying, they've been listening to the living preacher, and finally the Holy Spirit breaks through with a concept. Why don't you become a Christian? And notice what this person does. It says they gladly surrender to Jesus. What does that word gladly mean? They're not saying, oh, you mean I have to stop eating whatever. That's not in their head. You mean I have to stop drinking or talking or associating or being entertained by or... They're not saying any of those things. They've been through that already in the wooing process. 
They finally have come to the place where those things aren't in their heads anymore. The sentence says, when the Spirit suddenly comes with a more direct appeal, the soul gladly surrenders itself to Jesus. Gladly. Tired of sinning and confessing. This person now knows there's a way to stop that. And they're happy about it. Now, what does surrender mean? That's right, nothing held back. This person hasn't even got it in their head to say one, yeah, but. It's not there anymore. The process is finally bearing fruit. A patient, protracted, process is now going to have fruit. This person is willing happily to say, Lord, nothing matters in this world, in this life. I want Jesus. And when that comes, we're starting the process now. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 366. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. He requires it. He's never going to change that. No one has ever become a Christian who didn't do it that way. Nothing held back. That is absolute minimum requirements to begin this process. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. Now justification is a big fancy word. It really means forgiveness. Yeah. Now let me run by that word for just a moment, forgiveness. What does it require to be forgiven? I mean, if we deal with each other, how do I get your forgiveness, or, you know, how do I... Okay, ask. Oh, okay, good. There's. <laughs> let's work with that for a second. Let's say, <laughs> let's say that Dan is standing by the door out there tonight, and on the way out, I give him a quick kick on the shin. <laughs> I say, well, I'm sorry, Dan. Sorry. And I go out the door. But I notice he doesn't leave. He's still standing there. So I come back in. And I go out again. Another quick one on the shin. I tell him, I'm sorry. He still doesn't move. I come in again. <laughs> and I kick him again on the shin. And I say, I'm sorry. What's he going to start thinking about me? <laughs> not going to believe it. Now, let's say... <laughs> He's going to be better cut away. Let's, let's, say, <laughs> let's say that uh, I come in the door and he does move this time. Ah, oh, he's, he's gotten smart. He's gotten wise to me. So he moves aside a little bit. I said, oh, okay. Good night, Dan. Oh, by the way, Dan, you going to stand here tomorrow night? <laughs> and he says, well, I might. I said, well, okay, if you do, uh, I'm going to come through here. I'm going to kick you in the shins and I'm going to say I'm sorry. Now, what kind of sorry is that? He knows that, and we know it. Do you think God is any different? We're not sorry until we stop. And if there's anybody in the universe who knows that it's God, we are not sorry till we stop. You can say all the words you want. It doesn't fit in here. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. Next sentence. And in order to retain justification, there must be continual obedience 
through faith that works by love and purifies the soul. What a wonderful two sentences. Just power packed with things if we just get a hold of them. This is not something we need to try out. It's something we need to believe so God can do it with us. And it always happens. Continual obedience through active living faith that works. Did you notice that one when we did it the first time? Anybody who says they have faith and does not include the word works doesn't have Bible faith. It's a counterfeit. Faith that works by love and purifies the soul. That's gospel. This cheap grace that's being taught in so many places is not to be found in the Word of God. God's plan is very expensive. Everybody gets beat up. Everybody. The olive oil in the branch stand, or the lamp stand here, is beaten olive oil. The Holy Spirit gets beat up. The lamp stand is made, made out of beaten gold. God gets all beat up in the process of salvation. So don't think it a strange thing that we get beat up some. It's part of the process. Hebrew says Jesus learned obedience by the things what? He suffered. He suffered learning obedience. Now how much sinning did he do while he was learning obedience? See, he proved that learning obedience does not require sinning. He proved it. We've got to get lots of things out of our heads. And please, don't even let that little yell but ever find the light of day in your mind. Because yell but is what people who aren't going to go to heaven say. That's going to keep them out. There are no yell buts in the Word of God. Amen. He never stutters. He means exactly what he says. It's never going to change. And we can really be thankful for that. We can count on him never to change. He's made so many wonderful provisions for Christians. And we want to see them clearly the more we spend time in the sanctuary. We're laying a little foundation tonight because we need to understand the true message of God has such a clear sound and it's so straight line there is no give in it. There's no mistaking what's being said when it's the gospel. You're probably aware of the statement. Ellen White says in uh, several places, but in 7a, under Malachi, she says on the last page there that John the Baptist never had truth languish on his lips. Notwithstanding the danger to his own life, he rebuked kings for their iniquity. And then later she says, our testimony will be more pointed than John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. I don't hear the real straight testimony out there yet. I hear lots of people hollering about apostasy, but that's not the straight testimony. I hear them hollering about medals and hypnotists and lots of things. That is not the straight testimony. The straight testimony is living like Jesus. It's righteousness and it cuts to the bone. Nicodemus was startled at the idea that heaven was so pure he could not participate in it. Yeah, that's what that discussion with Jesus that night did for him. The teacher of Israel. He was left out and Jesus didn't play any games with him. He was tender and tactful with him, but no games. He went right to the heart of it. First thing out of his heart was, you need to be born from above, teacher of Israel. That's no way to talk to a leader of the church. 
Yes, it is. Jesus was not playing games. He wanted that man's soul. He wanted him saved in the kingdom of grace. And the man knew it. He knew it. Let me read you a little statement from the Desire of Ages 3.22. The Pharisees to whom Jesus spoke this warning did not themselves believe the charge they brought against him. There was not one of those dignitaries but had felt drawn toward the Savior. Did you run into that one before? There wasn't one of them that didn't know Jesus loved them. He wasn't firing at them to make them look bad. He couldn't do that. He wanted them to understand who his father was. And they sensed it. They had heard the Spirit's voice in their own heart, declaring him to be the anointed of Israel and urging them to confess themselves his disciples. In the light of his presence, they had realized their unholiness and had longed for a righteousness which they could not create. Did you know that's what the leadership of the church wanted in that day? They wanted righteousness. They didn't know how to do it. But when they saw Jesus, they knew there's the answer. They knew it. Every one of them. But after their rejection of him, it would be too humiliating to receive him as the Messiah. Having set their feet in the path of unbelief, they were too proud to confess their error. But it was not without knowledge. They knew. <clears throat> and I really believe that wherever Jesus goes, people know that. In John 7.43 it says the people were divided because of him. There's a favorite taunt that's used today among some circles and it's there's a divider. There's only one who really does the dividing. It's Christ himself. No human creates the division. It only becomes apparent. That's all. The obedient, the disobedient. Nobody else. Nobody creates anything. It's just made clear. That happens every time Jesus goes someplace. This person is ready. Made the full surrender. Nothing held back. They're tired of this playing church real now. They're going to come through the entrance, through Jesus. They're going to get into the plan of salvation now. But they don't come alone. They have something with them. What is it? Okay. Alright. Little animal of sacrifice of some sort. They come through the veil, through Christ. But there's somebody waiting for this person coming through. The priest. Yeah. Nobody could come through there without confronting a priest. Now why was that priest there? Okay, he's going to be the officiator here, but he is not going to let this go any further until he looks at the animal. What's he looking for? Perfection. Did you say perfection? This pretty brave church. You know, ten years ago, whenever I said that word, it started a war immediately. That's how long I've been doing this. It's ten years. I can still remember the first few times that. Perfection? Every priest, every priest in this system knew that God requires perfection. Every one of them. There's a, an advertisement for cigarettes on some billboards. It says, you've come a long way, baby. We sure have. 
every priest knew God requires perfection. No spots, no blemishes on that animal. All right, let's say the animal passes inspection. Person comes through with their animal now. Ties it to one of the horns of the altar on the north side. He then, according to the English versions, puts his hands on the head, but the original language carries the flavor of he puts his weight on the head of that animal. What's happening? Okay, the weight has shifted, right? Now, when you talk to your Sunday-keeping friends, please, please bring this point out that sin moves. They don't know that. They think it gets eradicated. Yeah, they think that it gets blotted out. They think it gets cast into the bottom of the sea. They think it's separated as the east is from the west. They think lots of things that the Bible doesn't say is happening here. Sin moves. It's a very important idea. All right, so the sin is moved from the person to the animal. The priest stretches the head towards the sanctuary and the person with a sharp knife cuts the animal's throat and the animal will now bleed to death. The priest catches some of the blood in a bowl and then he'll continue the services with the blood uh, later. The person is free from condemnation but where is the sin now? The animal's dead. And the blood. Okay. And the blood is now in the bowl. You see, the sin has been moving through the blood. And it will eventually end up in the sanctuary, and the sanctuary will have a record of that sin. And that's where it sits until the end of the year. Jeremiah 17, verse 1. And I'll be uh, finishing quickly here. I never asked you what time these meetings end. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't say that because I can go for days and days. <laughs> Let's see, Jeremiah 17, 1. I said one time to a person, and one, I turned it around one time and said, if you have any questions, I'm available. This person cornered me. 4.30 the next morning, he was still going. <laughs> he was serious. Jeremiah 17.1 The sin of Judah is erased. No? no? <laughs> it's not what it says? What does it say? Written. Well, why do you write anything down? Uh-huh. It's going to be seen again, isn't it? Well, we're not even in the process of anything here, and already we have the clues of the investigative judgment here. A doctrine that some wise doctors say doesn't exist in the Bible. They're not reading the same Bible that I'm reading. Here it is in Jeremiah 17.1. I have written the sin of Judah with a pen of iron with the point of a diamond it is graven upon the table of their what? where's that? Uh -huh. it's who you are by your affections God says I'm going to record your forgiven sin on your mind now has he or hasn't he? surely I remember isn't this something that some very brilliant individuals with PhDs after their names say, well, God's forgotten. Well, if I remember, how did he forget? It doesn't even make sense, that kind of a statement. Let's keep this thing clear and simple. All this erudite theological jargon, forget it. God is clear. He says, I'm writing it down. And I know he's written it down. I remember. But that's not the only place. It says, and upon the horns of your altars. So God records the sin two places, in me and in his sanctuary. You know what that tells me? 
I can't say I'm saved. Because I'm not saved until all my sins have been taken care of and they're gone forever. Yeah, I'm not saved eternally. Let's look at that word saved and salvation and all that for just a moment. There's an interesting thing about us as, as a people. We say one thing and then we do another practice entirely. In so many areas, I'll give you one. We say we don't believe in verbal inspiration. See, well, that means that we don't believe that the word in Revelation 18, verse 1, and after these things that God wrote those down himself. We don't believe that as a people. We believe that John wrote in whatever language he wrote, then it was translated, then it came out into English, and all these processes are going on. This is the word of God conceptually, but these are not the words that God chose to be used. Men chose these words through the inspiration of the Spirit. We do not believe that God wrote the Bible. He inspired men to write the Bible. That is our stand as a people. And yet people will go out and do word studies. Yeah. They'll look up every time the word grace is used and say, this is what God means by this word every time. Well, wait a minute. If you do that, you're making all the men through all the centuries have the same exact thought in their mind when they use the word. And that's not the way it works with human beings. They had their own flavor of, of what they wanted to say conceptually. Now, why am I going through this? We do it with very simple words like salvation. We have been taught somehow, subliminally perhaps, that the word salvation means eternally. And the Bible uses the word at least three different ways. I'll give you the three different ways real quick. This person that we have been talking about who has come through is now forgiven. They are forgiven for their past existence. They are not forgiven eternally for everything they will ever do now. They have salvation from their past. They do not have salvation into eternity. So here's the first word of salvation we want to know. Salvation from the past. Redeemed from the past. Not eternally, but from the past. That means that whereas I was in a hopeless condition, none of us can ever take back one minute of our past. One second. That's done. Jesus says, I will substitute my perfect life for your ugly past. And God will now count you justified, forgiven, put on vantage ground and when he looks at you now it's as though that never happened. Now that's part of the good news. That Jesus through his merits is able to say it's not there anymore for you. You're free from it. And so the person gets to cross a line here. They're saved from their past. They have salvation from their past, but they do not have eternal salvation yet. Now, the word salvation is used another way. In this period here, after, and we haven't discussed how a person becomes a Christian yet, we're just talking about forgiveness so far. When a person is in the process of all these other pieces of furniture here, and we'll get to those tomorrow, when a person is living out all of these symbols here, this process is called the process of salvation. And it's to get you some place. A person still is not eternally saved here. They're saved from their past. They're in the process of salvation. But there's still no sign sealed delivered yet. Now let's do the third one. Okay, that's one, two. The third one is over here in the most holy place. And if you are a Seventh-day Adventist, you know 
that there is a final seal that must be applied to those who will go to heaven. That final seal in the festivals is called the Day of Atonement, the Judgment. When we receive that seal, and it's still in the future for every one of us, when we receive that seal, then we are saved into eternity and nothing can take it away. The Baptists were right. Once saved, always saved. They just put it at the wrong place. Yes, it's the truth. Once you are actually saved into eternity, it's forever. It cannot be taken away. So let's be careful who we're fighting with. Let's just clear up the terminology, that's all. I'll do that with one other word very quickly, because we're going to move over a lot of ground this week. We have to see the sanctuary issues very clearly, so we can see how the false gospel works. I'm not going to tell you the false gospel take too long to explain all that stuff. We're just going to hit the real one and then you'll see the difference. The word atonement. In all of Ellen White's writings, watch for this. His atonement. His atonement. That's the cross. That's not my atonement. It's His. It's His perfect Sacrifice. The word atonement in the Hebrew means cover. He earned the right to cover me. In the King James Version, the word is propitiation. In Romans, the third chapter, the mercy seat, the propitiation, the cover, the lid on the broken law. That's his atonement. Where do you suppose I should point to on this board for my atonement? You got it. That's where I receive my atonement, my day of judgment, my seal forever. None of us have been atoned yet. That is another misconception among so many of our people we sound like Baptists when we talk. I have not been atoned yet because God will only do that one time in all eternity and it will never be taken away from me. You can't lose your atonement. But if you believe you were atoned when you believe in Jesus and there are people obviously who have lost that, that makes a mockery of what God is accomplishing on this earth. We'll see that when we deal with the most holy place. We'll read all kinds of quotations and scriptures that night. We're laying a foundation here tonight. We need to see a scope here of a concept that God has to get us into his kingdom and his plan works. Let's go to Romans 3 and verse 25. I need to give you a few scriptures here and there to give you some handles to work with here. Romans 3.25 I want you to know that I'm not making up any kind of words. I'm just quoting either Ellen White or the Bible. Let's start with verse 23 for context. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, there's that fancy word, that word means mercy seat, the cover, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins, what? That are past. That's exactly what the sanctuary teaches when a person is justified through the merits of Jesus alone, that is for the remission of the sins of the past. There is nothing in the Word of God that says we are now 
free to sin because we're Christians. There is nothing in the Bible that says we are now permanently forgiven. That's the new theology. And it's in more places than any of us would care to admit. The sins that are past. Okay, I want to get to how you become a Christian here in the next five minutes. This person is forgiven. But forgiveness is not everything. It's not enough. I'll ask you another question now. We've all forgiven people. Did it radically change them because we forgave them? Make a whole new person out of them? No. Just forgiveness, that's all. Now, God's forgiveness includes more than what we think forgiveness is. That we just forgive somebody. When God actually forgives someone, there's another dimension to it. Now let's go back to Steps to Christ, page 23, for just a moment. This word repentance. Repentance includes not only sorrow for sin, but a turning away from it. Okay? So what we talked about before is on that page, Steps to Christ, 23. Repentance includes not only sorrow for, but a turning away from sin. All right. Forgiveness, if Jesus came to this earth to forgive us and take us back to heaven, why didn't he do it with Satan? Oh, okay. So he didn't do it with Satan. Okay, let's ask another question. If Jesus could just come here to the earth to forgive us and take us back to heaven, why didn't he do it with Adam and Eve? He didn't do it. Now, all right, let's bring it home. If Jesus came to this earth to forgive us and take us back, then why are we still here? The obvious answer to all three questions is he didn't come to this earth to forgive anybody and take them back. That's not why he came. Forgiveness is not enough. The next thing that happens on the earthly side is the labor made out of brass where did they get the brass from alright Exodus 38 verse 8 from the women's mirrors what's a mirror for ok you look and you see really what's happening there ok now the first thing a forgiven person knows is that the mirror is waiting James the first chapter the mirror is the law of God a person looks into that and knows, I can't do it by myself. I never have been able to. Nothing's really different except I've been forgiven. They know they have a problem. But God has a solution. There's something inside the labor. Water. The blood takes care of our past. The water gives us a new life. That's why Paul said, a new creation. It's a transformation of nature. It's not the old me anymore. It's a new spiritual me. Because Christ has come to live in me. And I now participate in divine nature. I'm no longer just a human. And so when anybody uses that excuse, oh, I'm only human, they're saying, I'm not a Christian. Christians don't say that. No, Christians have Jesus living in them. We'll talk about that more tomorrow night when we start. Now I want to read one little page from Early Writings 209 and we'll call it a night tonight. We got to the place where we know how a person becomes a Christian through just two articles here. Early Writings 209. Again, Alan White never trips. <laughs> it's so perfect. 
When the soldier pierced the side of Jesus as he hung upon the cross, there came out two distinct streams, one of blood and the other of water. The blood was to wash away the sins of those who should believe in his name, and the water was to represent that living water which is obtained from Jesus to give life to the believer. That's been there a long time. This is early writings. <laughs> the first book. Every inch of that is sanctuary language. And I don't care where you turn in these books. Every page is about the sanctuary. She wrote this for sanctuary people. And the reason that we as a people have not understood these testimonies is we don't know where to put the sentences. Let's just plug them in the right places and this will all come alive to us. We will hear God speaking to us. Christ object, yes. You know, you're, what you're saying about the the blood is for the forgiveness and the, the water is for the, the transformation, the new life. Uh, that's also found in 1 John 1 9, where it says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us. That's the past. And, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the cleansing is the word for sanctification, the word for transformation. Good, thank so you. They're both in that same. Beautiful. And by the way, you remind me of something I haven't said yet. Every verse in the Bible is in the sanctuary too. Like that. <laughs> we'll see how these all plug in as we go along here. Uh, okay, I was going to say something else. I'll leave that go right now. Okay, I told you I was going to quit here. So we have a package here. The blood for the past. The water for the new life. The water is a symbol of the life of God himself. He comes to inhabit us by His Spirit. So I'm going to say something dangerous in parting here. Some of us, if not all of us, were taught how to be humble when we first came in. Yeah, we were taught. It doesn't come from God, but we were taught anyhow. We were taught that one way you, you reveal your humility is to say that all your righteousness is as filthy rags. Well, Christians don't talk that way. If you look at Isaiah 64, verse 6, you will find out whose words they are. In verse 7, it says, Our iniquities have taken us away. It is rank sinners sinning who can say truthfully, All our righteousness is filthy rags. Now, what about a Christian? 1 John 3, 7, and we're going to close with the scripture tonight. 1 John 3, 7. My little children, let no man deceive you. Did you notice how he started that? <laughs> Men will do that. Inadvertently, perhaps, but they will try to do that. Even subliminally, they don't know. They deceive themselves. But John says, my little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. That's what God says. And that's what Christians know. None of this games of humility using scriptures the wrong way. 1 John 5.18 we know. By the way, Christians know things. They don't have faith in anything. They know. I've never heard a true Christian say, I have faith or I believe in this. Or no. Christians know the Word of God. Christians can say, we know. We know that whosoever is born of God, what? Sinneth not. He keeps himself and that wicked one touches him not. Satan is not a factor in the Christian life. And we'll explain that when we get to the table of showbread tomorrow. Sanctuary says all these things. We just need to keep bringing things in and fitting them in the right places. 
But this is a glorious message. It is a message of victory, of overcoming, of obedience, of love. It's a, it's a message of bliss and happiness and peace with God. It's a message that if we share this with people, they're going to say, who is your God? That's what they're going to say. Okay. Tomorrow night we'll have time for questions. If you have questions, you think about them, please write them down because you'll forget. <laughs> okay, that's the way it goes. We're going through a lot of information real quick. So please write things down and we'll try to handle them. And every question is legitimate. You may be thinking something and ten others are thinking exactly the same thing, but they won't say it unless you do. So <laughs> let's just open it up and let's, let's have a sharing time. Okay, let's do that for tonight. Forgiven for the past. New life. Well, I was going to give Christ Object Lessons 315. I need to give you that for your notes. What page? Uh, 314, bottom first. 314, last sentence says, When a person receives Christ, that these two steps here, when a person receives Christ, he receives power to live the life of Christ. And then on the top of 315 it says, God requires perfection of his children. And we'll see why tomorrow night. He can't do anything else and still be God. It's all going to be clear and make sense to us as we see how the scriptures, spirit, prophecy, and the sanctuary all are saying the same message. And it's like I said before, to me it's just a glorious, beautiful message we need to be sharing with people. Right now, we need to share it with the Seventh-day Adventist Church first. That's our first task. Yeah, that's where Jesus sent the apostles the first time around, to the church. They needed his message then. We need it today. When God has some people in his church that believe him and are doing what he says, then we can start evangelizing the world the right way. And it's coming. It is a thrilling thing to move around the world and see what God is doing. He's building the remnant right now. The ones who are going to finish it up. And everywhere I go, I see the clues of that. It's a blessing to me to be able to see that. Well, let's pray.